I'm going to hope that doesn't happen again. That's that's the weirdest crash I've had on a computer for a long time. So I don't know what what happened there. It's going to maybe the machine starting to die down. I'll go back to it at the start of the talk. I was going to give you a bit of a coverage about the assessment, and there's quite a bit of assessment in the subject. There's four major components to it. The first one is on methodology, and I'll give you a hint. You know the question I've got there asking you which question you should prefer in economics, which one do you think makes more sense? I'm going to be asking an essay about that, because you're going to be talking about it in tutorials today. So do consider and, and talk through that particular topic with your tutor and get some sort of feel for how you might approach the essay. There's also going to be a, a, a macroeconomic essay, largely around Brexit, which is the, the topic du jour. And a group assignment. Now, I'll say this straight away. I was involved in one of the largest group assignments ever done uh, in my undergraduate days. 28 students involved in the thing. It was a nightmare. Okay? Um, and group assignments are always, relatively speaking, a nightmare. People always complain about them. The reason we insist on them is because when you get out and work in the workplace, you're going to be doing the same thing. So you might as well find out what it's like to manage one at universities. That's one re major reason why we have a group assignment in the subject. Uh, anything else getting in the way here? Stop installing that. Go away. That's Apple getting in the way there. And there's also a book report on one of the books we ask you to buy for this subject, which is called Poor Economics. Has anybody bought this yet? Good. Okay. So when you write your own impressions of the book, that's the cover of it there. So that's the, one of the four major components of the subject. And again, this is a subject which is trying to give you a wide range of approaches to economics. So do get hold of that book, do read it, and yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if it's the same for everyone else, but I don't have any particular reading list. Pardon? You don't have any? Reading list for this module? No, it's just this particular. Yeah, the reading list, is, we had one there beforehand, but it was dramatically changed. I'll, I'll show you this at the Gala from two years ago, and you'll see what's changed, okay? okay. But with that huge change, I just basically had the choice of trying to fiddle around with the state of the site, as the study space as it was at the time, or trash the whole thing and start again. I chose the latter approach. I'm paying for it right now. So it'll, it'll slowly build a reading list. And you'll find when you get back to, when you look at the study space again later on today, there'll be three references on methodology that I'll put up there, and I'll try to add to those over the next few weeks. But it's it's going to be a bit of a rush, I'm afraid, because I've got a lot of teach speaking engagements coming up right now. So what I talked about last week was talking about the different schools of thought in economics and the state that economics is in right now, which is highly unusual. Uh, there is, hasn't really been a period of debate in economics like we're having right now since the mid-1930s. Okay. So you're in a very, very unusual period in economics. And I think there's a strong analogy you can make to the state of astronomy back at the time when the discoveries of the, of the uh, moons of Jupiter and things like that were being done that completely changed the nature of, of astronomy at the time of Copernicus. So what I'm going to do now is talk today about the mainstream, which is the... Who's done economics at school here? OK, but about half of you. Well, supply and demand. You've all seen the intersecting supply and demand curves? It's that approach to economics. Then next week I'll talk about what's called the Austrian, or you might hear it referred to as libertarian economics That's something which Maggie Thatcher was particularly fond of, and you'll find a lot of people in political circles are influenced by that. Post-Keynesian, which is the area that I'm largely associated with. Uh, so I'll talk about those three schools in the next three weeks. And then after that, I'll talk about a major blind spot for all economics, which happens to be the environment. Um, so I'll be talking partly about how they relate to the other schools, what they think of the other schools of thought themselves, and how they evolved over time, and then particularly how they reacted to the financial crisis in 2008. That's been really a defining event for economic theory because most economic theories had no idea it was coming. And then when it occurred, there was a big question, well, should we have seen it coming? Why did we miss it, etc., etc. So the main thing I'll talk about today is the mainstream, and that's covered in detail in the course Economic Policy and Principles that I think you're all doing, aren't you? Okay, so I'm not going to go through a great deal of the detail there. What I'm going to do is go one step beyond it and say what you're learning in that particular course is how a, a supply and demand interact in a single market or a model of the whole macroeconomy just using one diagram. Those are the two extremes you'll take. I'm going to say, can you get between the two? Can you go from the model of a single market to what happens at the economy? How do you get from that step? That's the major thing I'll talk about here. And then also how the school is reacting to the economic crisis. 
Now, somebody asked for more advanced reading last week, and again, you said, I'm apologising again for taking a while to get study space up to speed because of that major revision. Um, but if you really want to get into detail on how I approach economics, that's the book that I recommend. Okay? I didn't make it a text because I'm not about to force you to pay me money. Okay? But if you want to, take, want to take a look at it, it's in the library. And you can also, if you want to take a look at it for, um, um, for purchasing yourselves, you can get it through Amazon. It is, it's not, there's no mathematics inside there, but people tell me it's heavy going. Okay? I'm going in quite, quite a bit of detail, step by step through the subject. But to give you an idea, it's 125,000 words. So that's a fair amount of uh, detail uh, on economics. So if you want to really you know, cut your teeth, take a look at that. But you don't need that for the subject, so it's, it's more detail than you need, just for those who want to go in further. Now, mainstream economics is a supply and demand approach you're taught at high school. Even if you haven't done it, you've all seen the idea of intersecting supply and demand curves. So it's, it's that particular orientation. And there's two components to it, two major components. What they call microeconomics, which is supposed to be about how, how individual markets behave. So you talk about how demand comes from consumers who are trying to maximise their utility subject to the incomes that they're earning. So you're trying to make, get the best satisfaction for yourself with whatever income you have. And then supply, set mainly by the model of what they call competitive firms. So firms that <coughs> allegedly can't set prices and they sort of determine the, the supply curve and the market gives you the interaction of the two. You'll be taught a bit about different market structures as well, so oligopoly where there are a few firms is discussed and monopoly where there's just a single firm. You'll do a bit of that detail. All that will be covered in more detail in principles, the policy and principles, so I won't try to explain it all there or here. But what I want to talk about is how this actually, how do they fit together, because frankly they don't. And macroeconomics is the model of aggregate uh, entities. So if you're talking about the rate of employment, the rate of inflation, how fast GDP is growing, all the stuff you'll see discussed in the newspapers, that's macroeconomics. And what this school has done is argued that they should build their macroeconomic analysis by starting at the micro. So what you learn in micro is supposed to be scaled up somehow to the macroeconomic level. And that's what I'll be talking mainly about. How do you do that? Uh, can it be done? <coughs> and then what sort, of, what sort of economic analysis does it give you? Now, this is an interesting little uh, example of how mainstream economists react because there are disputes inside economics. So you might get other economists telling you that they're not at all settled, etc., etc. I wanted to show one guy who makes that case. I just hope the sound works OK here. Let's see how we go on the, on the sound here because this is a discussion between two students. These guys are in their... I think their master's students are in their mid-twenties. And they got involved in a debate with their, one of their professors on national television in Holland. And it's in, it's, it's, in, it's in Dutch, but the subtitles are in English. Let's hope it works here. Let's see. George Bush, of course. Can you read the text there? Economen gaan uit van rationeel denkende mensen en ze baseren zich vaak op wiskundige modellen. Maar kun je de werkelijkheid wel reduceren tot een model? Free thinking economics, een wereldwijde beweging van economen, wil dat het economieonderwijs drastisch wordt gewijzigd. Niet alleen modellen, maar ook aandacht tot psychologie en tot politiek. Ook in Nederland zijn studenten actief, maar ze krijgen weinig bijval. In buitenhof een debat tussen econoom Jonge Schiedemann, <coughs> economie-student Lorenzo Krenkel en economie-professor aan de Vuk Pieter Gautier. Wat ik wil je focussen is deze guy's facial reacties. Oké? Okay? En hoe hij reacts to how the students are criticizing uh, mainstream economics. Jonge Schiedemann, om bij jou te beginnen, um, wat is je grootste bezwaar bij het huidige economie? Nou, we staan in deze tijd voor een aantal grote uitdagingen. Uh, en we zijn een enorme crisis in het financiële systeem. Een groeiende kloof tussen arm en rijk, klimaatverandering. En heel vaak bij dat soort grote maatschappelijke problemen is de kern van het verhaal een economisch vraagstuk. Um, dus wij zijn economie gaan studeren om, om dit soort ontwikkelde issues beter te kunnen doorgronden, om de grip op te krijgen. Um, en om hopelijk wat te kunnen bijdragen aan oplossingen. Maar onze studie heeft ons daar heel slecht voor voorbereid. En komt het? 
<coughs> nou, je krijgt eigenlijk een uh, tunnelvisie op de economische denken mee. Kijk, de economische wetenschap die is heel breed. Uh, die bestaat uit zo'n negen grotere theoretische stromingen. En met elk hun eigen perspectief op de economie. En elk hun eigen bril als het ware. En hun eigen blinde vlekken daar mee. En in onze opleiding ligt er een enorme focus op één van die benaderingen. En hoe heet die? Dat is de neoclassieke benadering. Um, uh, Oké, okay, dat is helder. Dat is wel Ja, volgens mij zijn er iets van 30 uh, benaderingen van de economie. Dat is één grote mainstream benadering, die schat 98% van de mensen doet. Just on that particular thing, did you see what he said? There's 30 different schools and 98% are in one school. So that one intriguing little factoid I can give you is that France is a very different academic structure to what applies in England. So in France, you have to register as an academic in each profession, economics, physics, etc., etc. So they know how many are in each division. And there are, there are 1,800 academic economists in France, roughly. And two years ago, there was a movement <coughs> to create a separate, what, the, what you might call heterodox, subdivision for promotion, because in that 1800, uh, all the competition to get transferred from one university to another or get promoted inside one university has to go through that hierarchy. So they, this, the, the small group inside the 1800 said, who would like to form a new group? And 300 said yes. So it means one in six, not, not, uh, not 2%, which is one in 50, are members of the alternative schools, but apparently about one in six, and possibly more than that. Ja. 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 Uh, ik weet niet precies wat hij neoclassiek noemt. Sommige mensen noemen neoclassiek één heel klein specifiek model, waar geen enkele frictie is, die aan alles weet. En sommige mensen die noemen neoclassiek uiteindelijk wat de mainstream doet. Oké, okay, dus we zetten die andere ja. plaatsen hetzelfde bedoelen. Zullen we het over de mainstream hebben of is dat een hele klein specifiek model? Oké, dat is het onderwijs. Ja, goed. Gaat het er? En daarnaast zijn er nog van 30 andere, je hebt de islamitische economen, de feministische, de Oostenrijkse economen, de post-Keynesiaanse economen, noem ze maar op. Um, en de vraag is, moeten die ook betrekken in het curriculum? De zanger lijkt me niet een heel goed idee, um, juist omdat die mensen maar ontzettend diverse is. Die groep van de afsplitsing, de heterodoxe economen, zoals ik het ook noemen, dat is eigenlijk een groep die zich wil onttrekken aan, aan de tip van discipline van de mainstream. Dat zijn, uh, het zijn congressen, dat zijn toptijdschriften, daar stuur je werk heen, dus dan gaan we bij alle wetenschappen. En het is heel erg lastig om erin te komen. Hè. De meeste van de toptijdschriften worden maar 3, 4 procent geaccepteerd. Als je niet inkomt, dan kan je proberen iets laag te gaan. Veel van de heterodoxe, die willen eigenlijk niets mee te maken, die leggen hun eigen tijdschriften op. En je ziet een beetje andere wetenschappen gebeuren, zoals de biologie, heb je de intelligent design, de klimaatwetenschap, die ook nog goed sceptici. En ik denk ja, dat ik dat heb. So he basically thinks all the opposing schools are like climate skeptics or people who believe in intelligent design rather than uh, evolution. And that's fairly typical of the mainstream. So they don't actually think there's anything other than the mainstream. That tends to be the position. Though they're starting to change on that front. I've changed the slides a bit this year to reflect <coughs> that. So the theme is just economics, just like you've done in your textbooks. And um, why is this mouse not working? The computer's breaking down on me today. Um, so... To them, to the mainstream, the other schools are unscientific. Okay? They don't get published in leading journals because they don't deserve to get published. Um, and the neoclassicals themselves tend not to be fairly aware of their own history. So they talk about themselves evolving from Smith and Ricardo, which are the original uh, economists. And if you read Mancu's textbook, do you have Mancu at all? Do you use Mancu? Okay, some of the universities use it. Yeah. Um, so in that book, he says in 1776, uh, Smith made one of the most famous statements in economics, and that's true. Uh, and he says, the way Mancure describes it, households and firms interacting in markets as if they are guided by an invisible hand leads to desirable market outcomes. That's the idea that individuals trying to maximise their own utility and profits leads to a socially desirable outcome as well. And he says, we want to explain how that actually happens. Now, when you take a look at... Um, um, that's, that's the section that I've quoted there. Okay. And he says, many of Smith's insights remain at the centre of modern economics. We'll go through and explain it more precisely and talk about the strength of the invisible hand. But if you actually read Smith, and I do recommend you to go and read that, I'll give you some links to enable you to find those references yourselves. What he was actually talking about was, 
is to saying people, a bit like an early version of Brexit, people were arguing that if, we, if they opened up free trade with Portugal in particular, which was the main competitor at the time, it would wipe out English industry. And he was actually using the invisible hand as an argument as to why investors would not take their production offshore, which some of his critics were arguing they would do. So by preferring the support of domestic to foreign industry and by directing that industry to produce the greatest uh, value, he intends his only gain, but he's led by an invisible hand to make things better for everybody. But he's starting off by saying that they, this will lead them to keep their production locally rather than taking it offshore. In some ways, he's actually talking about patriotism rather than what the market will do. And that the most important difference is Smith had a very different theory of how value is created in a capitalist economy because in the stuff you learn these days, utility is seen as being a subjective thing. It's all about maximising utility, and that's something subjective. Every person has a different thing they get utility out of and a different way of valuing it, and you simply can't compare them. But Smith believed that value was actually about effort. It wasn't about consumption. It was about production. It wasn't how much satisfaction you got. It was how hard it was to produce what you were using. So when he spoke the very opening of the wealth of nations. He starts by saying the word value has two different meanings. Sometimes it means utility and sometimes the purchasing power of other goods. And he says the real price of everything is the toil and trouble of producing it. So his definition of value, and it comes down to the effort or the cost of production. Um, and it says ultimately that results itself to labour as well. Now that's a very different way of thinking about the, the economy to neoclassicals who say demand and cost of production together set price. So he's saying, Smith is saying, effort is what determines cost and effort resolves itself mainly to labour. And here the neoclassicals say, well, demand and supply are both needed. You've got to have the two. So Smith had cost of production determining price and demand determining how much was produced. There were two separate actions there. Very different to what the neoclassicals talk about. So if you want to see where the neoclassicals come from, you don't go to Smith. You go to people who were like with the minority back when Smith wrote, people like Jeremy Bentham, Jean-Baptiste Say, Corneau, names you wouldn't necessarily have heard before, but they were the people who thought the way that neoclassicals do now. They were the minority then. And they, were not, they, were, they were not the mainstream back in those days. So what they saw was they, they didn't see values coming out of effort. To them, there's no wealth without creating, creating utility, this is Jean-Baptiste say. So then utility was the focus of a capitalist economy, somehow maximising utility. But it was the minority position back then. People like Marx and, and Ricardo and Smith all said that utility plays no role in setting price, and this is Ricardo, saying utility is not the measure of exchangeable values. So he really saw utilities having no role in setting price. He said something has to have utility to be saleable, but it, the utility it gets does not determine the price. So it's a very different measure to what the neoclassicals use today. Now, the neoclassicals began in the 1870s. Largely, that's when they became dominant. There's three major names we associate with them. Stanley Jevons, who was English, Leon Volras, who was French, and Karl Menger, who was Austrian. And they all, at much the same time, came up with much the same idea, where utility was the essential thing about a capitalist economy, maximising utility. And they both try to build mathematical economics. And Valra's approach dominates. So if you talk to a neoclassical economist these days, or a mainstream economist, and say, are you a Valrasian? They'll most likely say yes. So they see themselves as coming from Valra. Now Valra, he asked that key question that I posed as describing the neoclassical school last week, and that is, can a set of free markets reach a set of prices that assure that supply and demand are in balance in every market. And that's one step beyond the question you've done so far in micro. What you'll do in what you've done at school and what you'll do in policy and principles is consider how a single market reaches equilibrium. And that's not too hard to think about. Okay? Issues about it, I won't go into them in this course, but it's a fairly simple to talk about one market in isolation. But what Vora was saying, what about all markets? What have does one market coming towards equilibrium push others out 
of equilibrium or further towards it as well. And what he was actually basing himself on was the markets that existed in France at the time, which are called open outcry markets, where in a particular institutional building, people who were selling wheat or people who were selling flowers and buying flowers would set a, have a, a set of prices, a price declared, and then the market auctioneer would work out whether supply and demand were equal. If they weren't, he'd change the prices until they were. Now, that happened in individual markets. Varro was saying, how does it happen with all markets? How do they all link together? And so he imagined a, a single building where all people who wanted to buy and sell everything turned up with their goods ready to try to work out a, a set of prices. And initially, a random set of prices were declared. And those prices would mean some markets were in surplus and other markets were in, in deficit. And what the auctioneer did here was not just work out whether price and demand and supply were equal in a single market. It had to work out whether they were equal in all markets at once. So if there are markets where demand was greater than supply, the auctioneer would raise the prices, where it was the other way around and reduce prices. And only once all markets were in equilibrium would trade finally occur. So you'd be sitting there waiting for, you know, you, you might be in balance in the shoe market, but the wheat market wasn't in balance, and until the wheat market was in balance, you couldn't sell or buy shoes. So Vora said, can that system actually work? So he said, imagine a market where only consumer goods and services are bought and sold, and then initially some random set of prices are declared, and then each person works out how many they want to supply and, and how many they want to buy of each good they've got. Do they have more than they want or less than they want at that set of prices? And then they work out uh, what their demand and supply is. And then there'll be a new set of prices which the auctioneer will set. And the prices will rise and fall in every market until they're all equal. And then once equilibrium applies across all markets, which they call general equilibrium, then when that happens, that's when exchange will take place. Now, while I believe that process would work, does it sound reasonable? Yeah. OK, it sounds reasonable that it a superficial level, doesn't it? But it's actually a mathematical process. And Volrad did not have the mathematics, actually nobody had the mathematics at the time to work out whether it would work. So he said, this will appear probable if we start from a set of prices which he has P dash B and go to a new set of prices P double dash B, then if you do it in each individual market, that reduces the, if there's oversupply, that brings that market to equilibrium. So you do it in each market. So what that will do in other markets, well, directly in, in market B, that pushes you towards equilibrium. What about markets A, C, D, out to Z? What happens with them? Sometimes it'll push them away because you change income in those other markets. Other times it'll push them closer to equilibrium. What's going to be the over, overall level? Well, he, his reasoning was to say, well, the direct effects in each market push towards equilibrium. And that's all going towards stability. The indirect effects go in both directions. So probably he thought the direct effects will dominate because the indirect effects will cancel each other out. And therefore, ultimately, each time you do it, you're going to get closer and closer to equilibrium prices. And finally, after 10 or 20 iterations, you'll get there and then everybody can trade. Okay? That was his intuition. But he couldn't prove it. So what you had is this idea of here's the wheat market and prices in the wheat market are such that supply exceeds demand. So what the auctioneer does is reduce the price for wheat, declares a new price for wheat, and that pushes you from this original level where the price is well and truly out of equilibrium, closer towards equilibrium, could be go one side or go the other. So that's markets closer towards being in equilibrium. But what happens to all the other markets? Because you've got, you know, you've got the market for cars and for beds and cameras and fridges and holidays. What happens to those markets when you push this one market closer to equilibrium? That was the problem that Bauer was trying to solve. And it wasn't economists who solved it, it was mathematicians, and they didn't do it deliberately. It was simply a mathematical theorem that they were interested in, which was the issue of what are the properties of an array... You know what a matrix is? Okay. An array of numbers, it's normally a square array of numbers. What are the properties of a square array of numbers when they're all either equal to or greater than zero? That was simply a mathematical theorem. And it's an extremely complicated theorem. One of the mathematicians I greatly respect just describes it as non-trivial. Okay, non-trivial means it takes a lot of work to understand this theorem and to work it out in the first place. It's called the Perron-Frobenius theorem. 
But when that was applied to volarised mechanism, it actually meant either prices or quantities would be unstable. So either you'd get the prices converging, but the quantities would move away, or the quantities would converge, or the prices, you could not get both. And so if the initial levels weren't in equilibrium, the process would never get you to equilibrium. You couldn't reach equilibrium from being in a position of disequilibrium. And this was one of the first papers to reveal this result in economics in the early 1960s. With the result, the mathematics was actually first worked out in the 1920s and, uh, 1910s and 1920s. And it's complicated to explain, so I'm going to try to do it in a, a simpler way as I can. Stop me if I'm going too fast, because there's going to, there's going to be some mathematics here. Because there are two conditions that you need to reach equilibrium. One is that output, and this is talking about an economy growing over time now. So you're saying, can a market where the amounts of goods and services are growing over time, as we normally expect to happen, what are the conditions to make it grow smoothly over time so every market grows in equilibrium? Well, first of all, output of every good has to be growing at the same rate. Okay? Otherwise, you've got disequilibrium. Some markets growing faster than others, which will mean prices might be... Relative prices will be changing in that situation. And secondly, relative prices have to be constant. That's the definition of equilibrium. So all quantities growing at a smooth rate and all prices, relative prices, remaining constant. So the first condition is that output next year, T plus 1, so output in 2018, has to be 1 plus, plus the growth rate, rate times output in 2017. Obvious enough? <coughs> but when you do it, when I'm talking about um, output here, I'm not talking about a, you know, a simple lump of spam. I'm talking about a whole array of numbers. How many cars are produced, how many iPads are produced, and all growing smoothly over time at the rate G. So it's a list of things called a vector. Now, every element has to be growing at the same rate. And the simplest way to describe this is imagine you've got a cooking recipe now because what you've got to do is take inputs from outputs as one from one year as inputs to producing what you produce the next year. So imagine you've got ingredients for making an omelette, you know, three eggs, an onion, a tomato, etc., etc., and then ingredients for a cake... Uh, all those, each, each row of those numbers is going to be the elements in a, in a recipe for each product. But there's going to be, if there's 100 products, there'll be 100 rows giving you all those numbers. And call that R for recipe, then this equation has to be true. Output in, year, in next year has to be this array of recipe numbers times output the previous year. Otherwise, you won't have smooth growth. So G is a, a simple number for the growth rate, and R is this array of numbers. Both of those have to be true. Follow that? To get the growth. I'm not expecting you to reproduce in an exam, by the way. This is giving you a, a bit of background to understand where this economic got to. So output, I've got to change that from last year, 2016, is R times the output in 2015. <coughs> so that's, you know, red iPads, buses, etc., etc last year, or this year, and there's production recipes, how many bits and pieces of each you need, you need to make the different products, times what the output was in 2015. So that's the basic mathematical issue you face, and that's what the mathematicians, by accident, provided an answer for. So stability means that um, if they are not all smoothly growing at the same rate, can they converge to that rate over time? And that depends on a, a, a property of that array of positive numbers, which goes by the complicated German name of eigenvalue. But what eigenvalue means in German is characteristic value. So at some single, single number, you can describe, use to describe the behaviour of a whole array of numbers. That's what it comes down to. Uh, and the, the biggest of this, this characteristic number that you can derive using a mathematical process from an array of numbers, if the biggest value of those numbers is 1, uh, is less than 1, then the output's stable. Now, so that's the stability. You want this characteristic value of R to be less than 1. That's, that's your first necessary rule. Now, what about prices? Well, prices have to enable producers to buy their inputs each year and still make a profit. Otherwise, if you couldn't actually make a profit that way, you want to change your output somehow. So that gives you an equation like this. The prices this year have to be equal to 1 plus the profit rate times what you paid for your inputs. 
and that's the prices times the ingredients. So that's what you sell a cake for, you know, everything else you're selling. It's an array of prices. That's what you pay for the ingredients, and that's a uniform profit rate. Now, if you couldn't put all that together, again, you wouldn't have equilibrium. So that's the second condition for equilibrium. Now, you can notice I've got prices on both sides here. So this is a simultaneous equation you've got to solve. Now, when you solve that simultaneous equation, I've now got P is representing the prices, pi R for the profit rate, and then R for the recipes. Uh, well, to work that out, I've got to shuffle P around and R around, and this stability depends upon the inverse of R. Now, that also has... That R to the minus 1 has an upside in inverse characteristic value as well. So if the characteristic value of R was 0 0.05, which is less than 1, and therefore that means stability, the characteristic value of R to the, the inverse, which is necessary for the prices, is 20, 1 over 0 0.05. So stability of both of, of output depends upon the characteristic value of R, and stability of prices depends upon the characteristic value of R to the minus 1. So can anybody guess what condition you need for the characteristic value of R to guarantee stability. Zero. Pardon? Zero. No, but it's related to zero. <laughs> Pardon? Zero. No, because it's bigger than zero, then if you want zero point oh five, there's going to be twenty. Less than zero. It's got to be negative. What these mathematicians established back in the nineteen twenties was that the biggest value of R is actually positive. Just, they were just working out what happens with an array of numbers. You know, characteristic value would be greater than or less than zero, and they proved has to be it has to be greater than zero. So that's what what economists didn't want to know, effectively. And the reason that matters in this particular case is when you're working out a recipe of how to make things, you never use a negative amount of something to make an omelet. You don't use minus half an egg to make an omelet. You've got to have positive numbers or zero in your array. So this is a theorem called Perron Frobenius, and if you want to really scare yourself, click on the link and go take a look at the Wikipedia entry on the mathematics inside there. But that's why they called it a dual instability, because if the characteristic value for R was less than 1, which means that quantities would converge over time, then their prices would diverge. So if production was stable, prices would be unstable. So Wallace's process doesn't work. Now, that's, this is one of these things which happen when you ask a question like Vora did. You don't necessarily get the answer you want. And the problem is that how do you react to that? Well, what you should do is say, well, I don't like the answer, but I've got to cope with it somehow. I've got to take, take, it, uh, take uh, account of it. So that particular question, which as I've said is the defining question for the neoclassical school, the answer is no. Okay. Pretty profound. It should have changed the whole of mainstream economics. But it didn't because they wanted the answer to be yes. So lots of strange things happen. First of all, they tend to believe that they got the correct result even though they didn't. Or they'll say, well, that rigid recipes idea is a very um, stylized way of describing production. We talk about variable inputs. You know, you don't have to use one egg to make an omelette. And, uh, and one egg and one litre of milk, you can use 0.9 of an egg and, uh, and, and 1.05 litres of milk, etc., etc. Well, that's true, but as it happens, if you're looking near the equilibrium, the closer you get to the equilibrium, the more that rigid recipe actually dominates. So that particular, the flexible stuff dominates what you get away from equilibrium, and that might mean why you don't get crazy prices, for example, if you were willing to work away from equilibrium. But equilibrium is still unstable, even with flexible prices. That doesn't work, or flexible recipes. They then started adding extra assumptions. Well, if it's not stable in the raw, simple sense we've got there, how can we make it stable? Um, and this particular paper, Jorgensen, suggested that you might actually change people's minds. Okay. And then along came a guy called Debreu. Have you heard the name Debreu at all? Some of you have, OK. He won a Nobel Prize for a rather strange little book. Uh, but he then started saying, well, what an agent does on a particular day is make a plan for the entire future, not just your future or, okay, but the rest of the, li rest of the life of the universe. Uh, and in that particular case, the plans are made to be consistent from day one. Or they just assume equilibrium. 
they take it for granted. They don't actually analyse whether they get there or not. Or they've redefined it so that it's made stable. So they talk about intertemporal equilibrium rather than what was called back in those days input-output uh, equilibrium. And that's been a move from what were called originally computable general equilibrium models, which dominated the technical stuff that mainstream economists did back when I was doing my PhD, through what they call dynamic stochastic general equilibrium now, which the former ones had this big recipe idea, an array of inputs and outputs. This one has this idea of a single good being produced over time. And they've redefined equilibrium to mean equilibrium over time. So what you now get in modern economics is they've forgot all about all that Walras stuff, but they still think about equilibrium. And what they talk about now is saying that you should derive macro from microeconomics. And Robert Lucas was the, the dominant personality there. And he said that it's, he, when macroeconomics used to be separate to micro. And what Lucas did was say we have to derive macro from microeconomics directly. It has to be based in price theory. And they didn't... You'll, if you're learning the ISLM model, you will be learning ISLM, I think, in, in policy and principles. Uh, that's been rejected by the modern neoclassicals, the dominant ones. And they say we actually want to build a, a macroeconomics working directly from microeconomics. So the micro model has this idea of consumers maximising the utility. I'm going to go back on familiar territory here for a while. I know that was pretty hairy stuff, but I want to give you a, a background. The, the equilibrium they think happens at the macro level doesn't really happen. Well, let's go back to the micro where they talk about the consumer maximising utility and firm, firms maximising profits and perfect competition and equilibrium applying in all markets. That's, that's the micro vision. And what the, mac what the modern macro models do is derive their vision of the macro economy from that set of microeconomic principles. So the idea goes something like this. You've got a consumer whose preferences are represented by what they call indifference curves. Has anybody never heard that term before? You've all heard of indifference curves? Yeah. It's, it's like, you know, when you look on a weather map on the, on the uh, TV, which shows you lines of equal pressure then the indifference curve is supposed to show you combinations of different goods that give you the same satisfaction. And then income represented by a budget line. So that shows a line with uh, a price level, uh, relative prices, showing you what you can buy given a particular level of income. And you could arrive an individual demand curve from that. And then firms are supposed to produce based on having a cost of production based on fixed and variable costs, facing a demand curve, and they then their cost curve becomes their supply curve and you work out the aggregate and work out equilibrium that way. So the macro now applies that to the entire economy. So you have this idea of getting utility out of consumption. So the more you consume of something, the more utility you get, but it rises at a diminishing rate. That's the basic idea of diminishing marginal utility. So you get rising utility there, but rising more slowly, on the slope of the line is marginal utility. Now, if you consume more than one good, you can't just use a straight line for it. It's one I'm illustrating here. Imagine you have two commodities, coffee and biscuits. Then your utility has to be shown as a surface. Okay? And the higher up you get in the surface, the down to the blue, you're getting low utility, up towards the green, higher, to the red, higher still. But it gets the curve gets flatter all the way out. So the indifference curve is like putting those heights on a two-dimensional diagram. It's a contour map of that hill. Again, that's why I say the idea of thinking about it like a, a weather map is fairly in, in instructive. So having done that, you then impose, impose a, a budget line on that and say, well, there's your overall utility. There's your budget line. So you, given your income, you can either afford to have eight biscuits or ten cups of coffee or any linear combination of the two. And then you derive a demand curve by saying, well, let's now hold the income constant. So we're going to take the biscuits, the vertical axis is constant. So we imagine you've got an a income that can buy eight biscuits. And we then vary the horizontal, the cost of the horizontal goods, so you can buy more or less um, of those commodities. And what you get is a site with a low price of coffee. You can buy lots of coffee at that level. Then a slightly higher price, so you can buy less and then higher still, so less again, and less again. And having done all that, you can now say, well, put the price of coffee on the vertical axis and the number of cups of coffee on the horizontal. You work out the point of tangency in each of those lines, 
and there's the given a low price for coffee, that's the quantity of coffee you'll buy. Given a higher price, that's the quantity you'll buy. Higher price still, that's the quantity you'll buy. Yet again, and you then join the points up and you've now got an individual demand curve. So that's the sort of logic behind working out the demand side of the economy. So modern macro says let's apply that exactly the same concept, but rather than talking about consuming goods and stuff like that, we'll now say it's, you're making a choice between working, which means you can consume, or relaxing, which means you can have leisure. And we're about to um, take a bit of a break on that front in a moment. Now, so that consumer is supposed to be making a choice between a leisure on the vertical axis and the amount of income on the horizontal. And you then are working out the combination of, of working and leisure over time that's going to give you the maximum possible utility. So what you're actually supposed to be doing is working out that curve that relates how much you work and therefore how much income you get versus how much you don't work and therefore much leisure you enjoy, and that's where you decide how much labour to supply. And the representative firm does the same sort of thing. It's trying to maximise its lifetime profits now. So it works out an equilibrium time path to produce output and to employ and pay wages and so on. And that's the basis of the theory of how cycles occur at the macroeconomy, those two things coming together. And what they argue is that cycles occur because there'll be disturbances, changes to technology, how we produce things, changes to utility, what people get satisfaction out of. And when that happens, every time it happens, that optimal path for consumers and firms changes. So people therefore move to some new position and they adjust their trade-off between work and leisure and that changes the current employment and output but that was actually meaning everything you're doing in response to changes in the economy is actually voluntary. So if there happens to be a change that makes uh, the current wage less desirable to you than it was originally, you will therefore decide not to work. So it isn't you become unemployed, it's you choose leisure. And this is a quote from one of the leading papers that established his approach to macro. So if the, if the current fall in wages is regarded as temporary, so they think the wage is going to go back again. He may accept leisure now, brackets, be unemployed. How realistic does that sound to you? OK, shake your heads because it is off with the fairies and they're now starting to realise that it is. Um, let's take a break. We're going to have Joachim come in as the first of the year for Level 4 tutor. He wants to work out who are going to be the class rep. So, unfortunately, not another, you don't get a chance to escape the lecture theatre today, but next week we'll start taking a 10-minute break. Joachim, if you can... Yes, Just before you, we're going to work out who the class reps are going to be. But I want to introduce somebody whose name I've forgotten, but I haven't forgotten the personality. One of our lecturer and a student this last year in, in this course, and she wants to talk about the rethinking economics movement to you. So introduce yourself and take it away. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah I want first. Oh, okay, Jochen's taking stuff. precedence. Yeah. Okay. So uh, a quick, quick um, uh, recap. I, uh, I said last week, or I said eight students um, indicated interest in the student work. Can I? Can I check again how many students are still interested in doing this? So we know, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, of, okay, so if you, you are EC or you are Econ or something else. Sorry? Okay, you name it. I always want to get back to your email, but it's so hectic. Oh, it's only back on my book. It's a Switzerland one again, essentially. Oh, no. Yeah, it's in Poland last week. Speaking of the business conference. Busy now. Very busy. 
Yeah, we've been at James and Ryan's starting kind of read back the economic. So there's a lot of, I've got a lot like this. We're having a meeting tomorrow with another post grad called. I can't even remember his name now. Um, but yeah, because I didn't get to meet him because James had a meeting with him last week. But yeah, we're trying. I've got lots of ideas in terms of like maybe. I see you earlier. Yeah, you did. <laughs> Oh, I'm also an academic mentor, so... Um, oh, okay. Yeah, so anyone that's doing politics and economics, yeah. I'll see you. But yeah. Um, yeah, so I've got a lot of things. Doing these sessions in, like, different um, economic courts and like Marxist, um, Austrian, and that sort of thing. Excellent. So what I'm doing in the background. Yeah. 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 And I think I'll utilise the postgrads to do that as well, which would make it a lot nicer. Yeah. yeah. A bit more difficult yeah. having when you get to see that another lecture. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, Oh yeah, me and um, James and I are on the an RE trip to you know, which hopefully will come back you know, I think it's called E D A L E. It's somewhere north of yeah. It's in the UK. Uh, England. But yeah, so it's an RE kind of conference, not conference, but more than one actual notes the first time I've been to real many like minded people and different backgrounds. <laughs> Because you find that other universities are getting you know, kicked around by the staff and the board. Yes. And the yeah. I've got quite, we're quite privileged and we don't even see it. So when it's like, yeah. So when you hear about other people coming, it's like, oh, I don't have that problem. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, you're yeah. quite supportive. More than supportive. Yeah. So, yeah, that's nice. Um, yeah, we are, I think last year we've got quite a bit of money. Yeah, we've got quite a bit of money. We've got quite a bit of money around Yeah. I know, and the thing is, we, I know we can't keep online, so we're hoping to boost the union, like actual membership and stuff. Um, we've got a bit from last year, but I'm guessing the majority of that came from you, which is like £176. Yeah. Okay, thank okay. you very much. Thank you, I'm settled. Okay. All right, okay, now one more about rethinking economics, so take it away. Um, hello, hi. I'm Shanice, I'm a second year politics and economics student. Anyone that's doing politics will probably have seen me. Like the two in the other front. Um, so there's also societies, you should know about societies, I don't know if you saw us refreshers, the rethinking economics. Um, some of you may or may not have seen or joined up already. Um, so rethinking economics kind of promotes pluralism in economics in the way that it's being taught. So you already know about the idea of pluralism, speaking being our main advocate here, um, and this module becoming a promise and students. Right, it's all about that precisely. So the idea that you get to, there's more than just the mainstream neoclassical economics that you get taught at A-level, which is fair enough at A-level, it's quite a short a kind of syllabus, you don't have a chance to kind of, kind of do all of that, but at kind of university level you should be. You're paying 9,000, now 9,250 um, pounds a year to, for a course. If you didn't know that, 9,250 is now the new tuition um, fee because the parliament gave them a go ahead for universities that the teaching excellence, which is just a framework of saying how universities, whether or not they're up to scratch quality-wise teaching, um, they're giving them a go-ahead to increase their fees. And so, yes, that is including current students, so I am affected by this as well. But that's being sidetracked, sorry. Um, yeah, so we're having a meeting tomorrow um, at J... You know what? The easiest thing for you need to do is, like, if you join the page, so Rethinking Economics um, Pizza University, um, and you join up, I'll add you, and you can see the post. So it'll be tomorrow, one to three. I can't remember the exact room number, but yeah, there's also a lot of positions up for grabs, so we haven't, no position is filled yet. At the moment, myself and one other <coughs> undergrad is like kind of running it. That's just because all the postgrads were running it last year and the years before. We want to get more undergrads involved. Um, so yeah, a lot of postgrads won't really be allowed to run positions because we want more undergrad involvement for sustainability reasons, because obviously, Postgrads only here for like one year and then they go. So it kind of messes up the flow of the society. Hence the reason why me and James are trying to get you guys more involved. So if you want to run for president, vice president, secretary, um, treasurer, media officer, it's all up for grabs. So you can come to the meeting tomorrow or you can, we'll have an induction, sorry? Yeah? What about if you've got like sports or something? Um, we still have the induction, so the actual election won't be held tomorrow. This is just the idea. So we, the actual induction will kind of post on the Facebook site. So if you find the Facebook site, which should um, Kingston, Univer Kingston yeah. University Rethinking Economics, and it's got Cure next to it, which is our acronym. 
Um, no, we're not setting. We haven't set the actual meeting dates. That's just an unofficial meeting to get things into play. Yeah. Oh, benefits. Also, because our the reason the economics isn't just a university-based society, it's like an international movement. So universities across the world, quite literally, like Israel, um, all over, quite a few places in Europe, Germany. Um, this is a movement that's like across the board. So you do get into network with people from across different countries. There are trips, so like conferences that are held on an international basis. I think there was one in Vienna. I think one last year was held in, if I was right, maybe France. I can't remember exactly where it was. Um, but yeah, you get the chance to travel and meet new people with similar ideas to you. So yeah, the chance to network. Um, if you're running for the position, it looks really good on your, uh, on your CV. To even have something outside of your course is quite important. It's good to get good grades, of course, with your course, but when they ask you, like, you know, they are, they're going to see your grade and everything. When you go to an input, they go for a job, they want to know what else you've done. So anything other than um, thing. And if you go for an economics job, they want to see that you really do have an interest. Just saying that you've just done your course and you've done a lot isn't enough. You need to say, well, actually, I've done this outside of my own time. So, yeah. And plus, it's not just an academic. We'll have socials. Um, we want to make it really interesting this year. Last year, it wasn't as interesting. So we'll maybe go for drinks, try to go for like go-karting, something just to get people involved. And you get a taster of different economics um, schools of thought, which you should kind of be interested in as economics students anyway. But yeah. We'll have an actual induction, which explains it all. So if you've got any questions or want to see what the page, the page looks like this, for those of you trying to join. Um, yeah. If you've got any questions, you can come up to me and I can give you my email as well. And for Dom, yeah. No, I'm That's okay. Oh, one, thing, one thing I forgot to mention, by the way, there's a, because we're going to have, a, the, the, the macro essay is going to be a, a Brexit topic. There is a workshop on Brexit, which the staff are giving here. Uh, uh, I want to say four to six. Wednesday, sorry, Wednesday. Wednesday at four, four to six. six. Yeah. And there's a lot of posters up around. We might send an email via the module yeah. list for this to let you know about it. But it's actually an interdisciplinary thing, so there'll be um, Professor Staff Howard from our department is involved with people from s all, all, like a whole range yeah. of politics, sociology, everything. So it's an interdisciplinary look at um, why we break some teeth. And I'll, I'll put an announcement up on that to let you know the details on, on study space tonight. Pardon? It might be tomorrow, tomorrow night. night. Yeah. Well, there we go. It's tomorrow night then. Tomorrow they night. Send an email to confirm that that is it. Before yeah. We talk about the details we have. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Right, thanks a lot. Back to the lecture, I'm afraid. So, can you hit the switch there, Fidelma? Uh, to the second, the third one down. Yeah. That's it. Great. Okay. All right. So normal, normally when we get to the half, I know, I know it's like I'm, I'm saturating with a lot of information. Normally we'll take a break and go outside and come back again. These two weeks not, but as of next week we'll give a break in the middle. But back to the back to the serious stuff for a while, because as I showed you that strange comment about unemployment being in leisure, the most remarkable element of this school was actually you had to explain the Great Depression. So they saw the Great Depression as a long holiday. Now I know that sounds ridiculous. But this is the originator at this school who got the Nobel Prize for doing this work. He said business cycles are a response to shocks that shift the growth path up or down. And the growth, the growth path is where you'd be without any shocks. So if a shock uh, pushes the growth path down, then market hours fall. By market hours fall, means what he means is people do less work. And he said more time is allocated to leisure. So all those people unemployed in the Great Depression were actually taking a long holiday. And he then said what's different about the Great Depression was they had took a really long, long holiday. It took ages for it to come back again. Markets fell, market hours fell and stayed low. And something must have caused that, and he blames the government. He says there was some change to market institutions, labour market institutions and industrial policy changed those normal market hours and led people to voluntarily work less. And that's what caused the Great Depression, according to this Nobel Prize winner. So he said the Great Depression is a great decline in steady-state market hours, which he saw as the unintended consequence of some policies which were intended to improve the economy. But he can't tell us what they were. He's guessing. Okay. And his final punchline was to say capitalism is stable and without any changes to technology or whatever else, over... Over time, it converts to a steady growth path, 
with the standard of living doubling every 40 years, and there was some change to the rules of the game back in the 1930s that made that not happen, but it wasn't the, the, the economy's fault, it was people just making a sensible reaction to some change in policy. So the Keynesians were wrong, uh, and employment wasn't low because investment was low, they were low because some change in market conditions or policies changed the way that lowered normal, un normal employment. Yeah. Energy, you mean what, physical fuel or...? No, not back in the 1930s. Uh, it's a potential argument for the future, and I will talk about that in two or three lectures' time, but it's not an argument back then. It, that wasn't the argument he was making either. Yeah? Surely many neoclassical economics people believed in food and fast. I mean, I'm about coming on to them next. You're right, because this is extreme. Because there was a big political um, fight in the economics over this, being what they called salt water versus fresh water. Have you heard that expression used at all? You did. I did. Okay. Apart from me. Yeah, that's the freshwater stuff. What I'm giving you is the extreme freshwater argument that capitalism is perfectly stable and any, even, even, a, even a downturn like that is voluntary. Okay, so every time there's a rise in unemployment, it's because people are deciding to enjoy more leisure. And when it falls, it's because they decided to work harder. But all the way through, they're in equilibrium. And they're called real business cycle models. So any change is supposed to still leave the market in equilibrium at that time. Now, that was just too much for quite a few mainstream economists, people like Paul Krugman, Larry Summers, names like that you'd see, but many, many others by Michael Woodford and so on. They thought, well, that's just nonsense. Okay? It's, it's, it flows logically from the theory, but it's nonsense when you apply it to the real world. So their explanation is saying, well, it's because you're assuming perfect markets. You're assuming all markets are perfectly competitive, including labour. And if there are perfect markets, we agree, this is mainstream people, we agree there'd be no unemployment. But because there are some markets that aren't perfect, where there's market power and therefore things take a while to adjust, prices and wages are sticky, as they called it. And that explains persistent unemployment. And this is now one of those authors, a guy called Gordon, talking about it and saying a lot of authors have produced stuff based on microeconomics but reaching Keynesian conclusions and doing it by bringing in explanations that are consistent with microeconomic theory about why wages might be sticky, slow to adjust and why prices might be sticky. And they call this new Keynesian as opposed to the, the freshwater model they called new classical. And so the temporary disequilibrium, there'd be a shock, it would disturb the markets and the markets would take a while to return back to equilibrium again and while that time of, of, of returning to equilibrium was taking place, there'd be unemployment, involuntary unemployment. So that was their rationale for it. So they say the key feature of the Keynesian macroeconomics, and you'll learn this probably in third year here, and maybe second year with Debrum, uh, is that there's a non-market clearing model. The market doesn't clear at all points in time. And while it's not clearing, there's unemployment because markets can't adjust fast enough. So aggregate uh, price level will, will decline less rapidly uh, than it should and therefore prices won't adjust fast enough and therefore there'll be disequilibrium and people won't be able to get a job even though they want to, they want to have one. So that means there'll be sub-equilibrium below what the level you'd want of employment and output and it's a constraint, it's not a voluntary thing. That's the argument that the new Keynesians developed. So the policy implications were many. One of them was that fiscal policy was ineffective. They said that if the government does something because people rationally work out what the government's trying to do, they will do the opposite. So the, they generally saw fiscal policy as ineffective. And they said the main thing you can do is set the interest rate to vary people's rate of time discount. If you think about what the interest rate is supposed to do in this theory, it changes the costs of you doing something in the future versus doing it now. So if I, for example, the argument goes, if you had an interest rate of 10%, then $100 next year is worth as much as $90 now. But if the interest rate falls to 5%, then $90 now is worth more, is $100 next year is worth more than 90 now, so you won't consume now, you'll save money. So those sorts of interest rate adjustments were supposed to fit where uh, the economy, how the central bank controlled the economy. And this very simple formula is what's called the Taylor Rule, and central banks believe they could manage the economy to set the rate of inflation at 
That's why you'll always see the target of 2% as the number that, that, that central banks are trying to achieve, a 2% rate of inflation. It all comes out of this equation, and it pretty much says if the rate of interest is 2% and the economy is going at 3%, then the rate of interest should be 4%. Those two, three, four numbers actually come out of this very, very simple rule. Now, the theoretical implications of this led to what they call dynamic stochastic general equilibrium, DSGE models. You'll see that being talked about in the uh, literature all the time. And they derive the idea of a macro economy by starting with consumers who maximise utility on the one hand and firms who maximise profits on the other. And by the early 1990s, that was the dominant approach. But the intriguing thing is it was built on theories harshly built by a guy called Robert Solo. And he simply couldn't believe that anybody thought you could use his model and build a model of the macro economy. Because he was asking himself a question about what's going to happen over the very long run. He said one thing he knew that his long run model didn't apply to were short run fluctuations. But that's exactly what they were using his model for. So he said, imagine the economy is populated by a single immortal consumer. Now that was the original real business cycle model. There was one consumer who lived forever. He said, and that person is solving an infinite time maximisation policy. That person is working out what to do to maximise the utility till infinity comes. He said, that strikes me as far-fetched. I said, the end result uh, is about optimal adjustments all the way through. He said, and that's the automatic presumption that everything we see happening is happening in equilibrium. This, by the way, is not, he's another Nobel Prize winner. So these are Nobel Prize winners battling out what economics should be within the mainstream. They're not outside the mainstream. So he said, we're asked to regard the construction I've just described as a model of the actual capitalist world. He's just saying, I simply can't believe you that this is what you think is possible. So here's his little summary. He actually wrote a paper called Dumb and Dumber in Macroeconomics. I imagine you can all remember that. Go searching for it. You'll find it still on the web. He said the preferred model has a single representative consumer optimising over infinite time with perfect foresight in an environment that realises the resulting plans more or less flawlessly through perfectly competitive forward-looking markets for goods and labour and perfectly flexible prices and wages. Next line is important. How could anyone expect a sensible short to medium run macro to come out of that setup? So this is the debate that I want you all to be aware of in economics. It's not as clear cut as the textbooks and more conventional economic departments might make it out to be. So he said, you want macro to account for some of the pathologies that occur, recessions, stagnation, inflation, and even good times. A model that rules those pathologies out by definition is unlikely to help. So that's his particular paper. Again, I'll, I'll put the web, whenever I put the lectures up, if you see the blue links, they all take you through to those original papers. Now, what he's criticising there is the real business cycle models. It's before the new Keynesians came along and added in perfect competition. But he wasn't particularly fond of that either because he said these simpler models have had absolutely no empirical success. Uh, so as a result, some of the freer spirits, the what we call saltwater people today, have added imperfections for labour markets and so on. He said the model then sounds better and it fits the data better, but that's not amazing because they actually made these tweaks to make it fit the data better. So he's still saying it's not a particularly good model of the economy. Now, despite that, that became the dominant model. And it coincided with what's called the Great Moderation. Have you heard that term before, apart from, from me? Great Moderation? OK. Between 1980 and 2008, <coughs> unemployment and inflation, each, each unemployment peak during a recession was smaller and each inflation peak during a boom was smaller. And that trend, they thought, was going to go on forever and they called it the Great Moderation. Uh, of course, then the crisis hit, and it began in August 2007 when a firm, bank, the BNP, Banque Nationale de Paris, shut down three of its markets. And when you look in December, which is four months after that happened, the guy who ran the modelling for the Federal Reserve said, well, we're still painting a pretty benign picture of 2008. Despite all the turmoil, the economy avoids recession. And he then said he was... Uh, didn't take it personally when they said they might drug test the senior staff. Um, but the argument was 2008 was going to be a great year, even after the crisis began. And in August of 2008, I'm going to mention this guy several times in today's lecture, Olivia Blanchard. You ever heard his name before? 
He was uh, Chief Economist for the International Monetary Fund. He's just recently resigned from that position, gone to work in a, uh, a think tank. But he said, over time, uh, everything's got better. The state of macro is good. That's one year after the crisis began. So they didn't expect it to be that severe. This is looking at the growth rate now. And this is... Americans have a very strange way of measuring their growth. That They take each quarter and multiply it by four. So it's a very volatile series. But you can see that the worst downturn back in the 1980s, before that, wasn't as deep as the downturn in 2008 was in terms of the degrade of growth. That's minus 8%. This is about minus 8.5%. So the economy was falling at 8.5% per annum in that particular pair of quarters. And notice how this is zero markers of his here. You can see how tiny the gap is versus how large it is over here. So it wasn't just how deep the recession was, it's how long it lasted as well. And before the crisis, the average rate of growth is just above 3%. After the crisis, it's about 1.5%. So it's a major shift in the behaviour of the economy. And they weren't expecting anything like that. So we went from 3% average growth before the crisis to 1.7% since the crisis. And unemployment is now, if you look at unemployment and inflation, this is what they call the Great Moderation initially. You can see that there's the peak for unemployment back in 1983, then you have this in 1990, then 2001, and they basically thought it's going to go on forever. Then this happened. Unemployment exploded. Inflation was as high as 15% back in the 1980s. That's why your, your parents might freak about the rate of inflation being a really important variable. Uh, then it became down to 6%, 4%, hit 5 but it then, during the crisis, hit minus 2 and that hadn't happened since the Korean War. So it was a hell of a surprise, a hell of a shock to them. And the reason unemployment's fallen is now back to where it was beforehand, but if you take a look at this chart, this shows the participation rate so back in 1950, 65% of the population between age between 25 and 54, so I'm leaving out kids at university even, and I'm leaving out people who might retire, 65% of that population had a job in 1950. This is really the women coming into the workforce as, as well as economic conditions. That rose to 80, pretty much 83%. It stayed all the way through uh, until the crisis hit, and then it's come down and it hasn't recovered. So a large part of why unemployment's recorded as being low is there has not been a recovery in the percentage of the workforce of those ages that actually has a job. And when you think about it, people between 25 and 54 should have a job. Okay. So it's a, a big decline in how much employment there is. Ah, that's the, that links to the website. But the, I've got a, a live link on that, on that particular uh, graph. It'll take you to the data. It's a fabulous data source, by the way, called FRED. It stands for FRED. It's the Federal Reserve Economic Database. It's maintained by the St. Louis branch of the Federal Reserve. Highly recommended. You can put together all sorts of charts there. Fantastic data source. So do, do look at that. That was an accident to bring it up. But that's, that's why unemployment has fallen. So after the crisis, you saw some soul-searching going on. So here's a guy called Ireland, who's actually based in, in Boston, saying that there's the severity makes it tempting to think we've got to have a whole new set of theories. He then goes through and said, well, ultimately, we can explain it by the same sorts of shocks we used to explain other crises beforehand. They just lasted for longer and got deeper. So it was the shocks, unspecified shocks, that explained why the crisis occurred. And this means our new Keynesian theories are fine. He wasn't about to change the new Keynesian theories. So the mainstream, this is, it can sell that I'm critical of the mainstream. I'm not going to try to disguise that. It would be impossible for me to disguise it. First of all, they're working with an equilibrium approach when they've already proven it doesn't work. They've ignored that particular proof. That Volrasian model is unstable and there's many other problems I could detail. I detail this in debunking economics. They failed to see the crisis coming in 2008. And if you wanted economists for anything, it's to warn where you're going to crash the economy. Okay? They failed to do that. Uh, they're still chasing. So if you look at what they're talking about, this is Blanchard again. Now, notice how he said the state of macro was good back in 2008. In 2014, in an intriguing paper entitled Where Danger Lurks, he says that we took a very benign view. Yeah? How does that end up being a recession which is being widely predicted by economists and staff? Not widely predicted, that's a good point. Um, but some economists have predicted downturns very accurately. There's a, there's a range of, well, there's two approaches to doing One, you have a model that tries to say, here's my model of the economy, my model goes down, therefore I'm predicting the economy will go down. 
The others will probably develop a whole range of statistical indicators which you don't necessarily know why they give you a leading, uh, a leading hint that something's going to happen, but they're called leading indicators. So that'll be things like the uh, uh, PMI, not what PMI stands for, but it's uh, Manufacturing Index. And if it's above a certain level of expected recession or below a certain level of expected recession, uh, above a level of expected boom in the future. So that's statistical approaches. So some of the statistical approaches have identified it. But this one was unique in the sense that none of the mainstream theories predicted it. In fact, actually predicted a wonderful 2008. And even the one based on leading indicators, most of them didn't pick it. There were people who did. I'll talk about that next week. Uh, one week and, and the week after, but most of them missed it completely. But that's a good point. Economics has not been particularly good at predicting anything. But to get something to miss something this big, the Queen actually asked asked a wonderful question in 2008. She was invited to open a building at the London School of Economics. She had all these economists. You, know, you can imagine what they like fawning over the Queen. And normally, you know how polite she is. She actually said something in this meeting. I'm sure she says a lot behind wall by closed doors, but she actually said, if it was so big, why did nobody see it coming? And there was silence. And then one of the economists said, oh, we all thought that other people were watching out for the... We all, we all sort of thought it was somebody else's problem, you know. We, we, nobody had a full picture, and the little bits we all had seemed OK, so nobody thought there was any problem. And she said, basically, said, horrible. And then on went the conversation and about two or three weeks or months later they wrote a letter to her explaining why they thought the crisis occurred but it, it was again the idea that we only had partial information, we all thought we had complete information, it sort of fell through the cracks that's the best they came up with I'll put that one, I'll put that letter up on the website, okay, it's, it's an interesting one to see. Now in the aftermath of having failed so badly on this gigantic crisis they're now saying, let a, th- let a hundred flowers bloom. So they're actually saying we should encourage more approaches to economics, which is the sort of thing we're doing here. So that's a good change. But if you look back and see what, did they le- what, what might have been the reason why they didn't see it, well, money, banks and debt and the finance sector have absolutely no role in their model. Okay? There is no money, there is no debt, there are no banks, and there's no finance sector in the original real business cycle models and even the initial... DSGE models. So after the crisis, they're now adding what they call frictions in, because again they want to explain how if a shock comes along, then the finance sector is another source of reasons that will slow the economy down to getting there. But they're still saying it's a random shock that caused the crisis in the first place. They're not even explaining the crisis in that particular event. So here's a a quote from this particular paper. Uh, In the financial sector, you can normally mitigate crises. During crises, it somehow amplifies, and they're looking at what the feedbacks might be that enable that to happen. Uh, but they're still thinking that we should work in the equilibrium way. So this, is, I think, is Blanchard again. Uh, how, how should we modify our benchmark models? Um, and again, general equilibrium. Um, the easy and uncontroversial part is that we should expand them to include the financial sector. But should they also describe how the economy behaves in what he calls dark corners? And um, he said, well my models might still be appropriate when we're not in dark corners. Okay? We can still stick with this model when we're not in a bad situation. And trying to actually model how we get into a bad one may be beyond what we can do. So it's realising limit, there might be limitations to the way that they model the economy. Now, uh, here are some of the prominent personalities. This is Robert Lucas, who really started the whole thing. Thomas Sargent, one of his uh, colleagues, another Nobel Prize. These are all Nobel Prize winners. Uh, ben Bernanke hasn't won the Nobel Prize, and I think he's still praying that he might do it. I think it's a bit late for him. Paul Krugman, another Nobel Prize winner. So the top two are the, what they call freshwater ones. The three bottom ones are, are the um, um, saltwater. By the way, Blanchard wrote to me last week. He was most annoyed about a YouTube video of mine. I'll put that. I'm going to put a link up on the website. It's quite funny. But they are starting to question themselves. This is quite intriguing. There's many, many crises of what one is, why hasn't the economy recovered? Because they expected growth to go back to even faster than before the crisis to catch up. But as I showed you, it's been 3% before the crisis for 30 years, on average 1.25% since. Unemployment has recovered. It's 4.9% today in America versus 4.5% when the crisis hit. But that's mainly because participation has gone from 81% of 25 to 40, 54 year olds, to 82.9%. And that, uh, versus the, it's, it's fallen by about 1.5%, 2%. 
And that fall in participation is almost all the source of the fall in unemployment. Not everything, but a, a large part of it. Inflation is now below their target. So before the crisis, from 1980 until the crisis, the average rate of inflation was 3.9%, twice their target level. It's been 1.8 since then, and currently it's zero. So they've now, having in the past tried to, tried to drive inflation down, they're now trying to drive inflation up. So they're wondering why it hasn't responded to these low interest rates. Rates have been historical lows now for almost 10 years. How come the economy hasn't recovered? So there's two camps that have developed out of it. What I call the old-fashioned Keynesians, uh, and they use the ISLM model. They explain it by what they call secular stagnation. So they say been, there's been some slowdown in the rate of population growth, which is true, and a slowdown in the rate of technical change, which I think is questionable, and that explains why the crisis has slowed down. But looking at it, they think there hasn't been a financial crisis now for at least five years. This is Larry Summers in 2000 and 15, I think, or 2014, who said, so that should be surprising because without financial problems, um, one should expect growth to accelerate. I'll just see if I can just underline this. If a financial crisis is a kind of power failure, one should expect growth to accelerate after its resolution. So from their point of view, the financial crisis is over. The puzzle is why is growth remaining so low? And he says, slower population and possibly technological change. But there's been a much more interesting change just recently. These are the guys who do the, the, DS, the complicated models, the DSGE models. And they've just started to say, well, we actually don't know what's going on. So this is a paper that came out in July 17 of this year, incredibly recently. I've corresponded with this guy uh, as a result of the paper as well. And he was president of the Federal Reserve of Minneapolis, which is one of the freshwater institutions, so the ones who believe that all unemployment is voluntary. First of all, he flipped away from believing that and went from being a hawk on interest rates to a dove. Now he's come out saying things like this. He's looking at what he calls toy models, so very, very small stylized models rather than the hugely complicated DSGE models. And he said, um, in the foreseeable future, we might be better working with toy models than these really big, serious ones. And he said, the starting point of these serious models that build, build the economy up from a very, very elaborate construction of consumers and producers aggregating to the macro level. He says the, the, the premise for those models is that we, if we have a well-established body of theory of the macro economy. He said, my own view after the, from the mainstream point of view, highly surprising nature of the data over the last 10 years, this basic premise is false. We simply do not have a settled model of the macro economy. And it's a huge change. He's not the only one. I mentioned, uh, this is a bit more by him saying that the choices we made 40 years ago shouldn't be treated in stone. We're, we're choking off ways of understanding the macroeconomy if we do that. And he said many of the readers, and he's thinking he's writing for his own neoclassical colleagues right now because he's a highly respected individual, many are thinking uh, there are ways to fix the modelling paradigm. And think back to the astronomy example I gave you last week. You know, we can explain whether... We can add another epicycle around Jupiter to explain the fact that Jupiter has moons, that sort of thing, that sort of reaction... He said there's people probably planning to write papers like this and I'm sure they'll get published in the leading journals. He said, but that's rescue the paradigm at all costs. And he said that's highly unlikely to lead to true progress. I think this is a remarkable paper, really quite remarkable how much they've changed just in the last couple of months. Now, he's not the only one. Olivia Blanchard popped out this paper in August. So this is how ra radically the profession is changing right now, which is why I want you to be exposed to a wide range of views. So he said, do DSG models stand for have a future? He said, well, they stand for these dynamic stochastic models and characterise general equilibrium, and they make three strategic modelling choices. First of all, they derive the behaviour of firms um, and consumers from micro foundations. They work from all the micro stuff you're learning in principles. Secondly, they have a competitive economy, but with a number of distortions that mean that things don't work smoothly. And thirdly, they estimate the entire set of equations in one go. So rather than trying to work at each little bit and fit them to data, they work out a set of numbers that makes the whole model work. That's a, a difference to a, the way that old-fashioned models were done before these guys turned up. Now, you said the earliest models were based on the idea of productivity shocks causing cycles. And in later models, the stuff he's actually built personally, uh, we have a wider range of shocks and they're large-scale models with nominal rigidities, things that slow down things uh, converge into equilibrium. 
And he then says there's many reasons to dislike them. This is the guy said in 2008, the state of macro is good. Now he's saying there's many reasons to dislike current DSGE models. He says, first, they're based on unappealing assumptions. This is an extremely important observation from somebody who was so much part of the mainstream. Not just simplifying assumptions, as any model must, but assumptions profoundly at odds with what we know about consumers and firms. So they're not simplifying assumptions, they're false assumptions. Okay? That's a big thing to say. Secondly, the method of estimation is unconvincing. Uh, and he says, what often happens is people just use somebody else's paper to use provide a whole lot of numbers that are essential for making the model operate. And if anybody criticises and they simply say, I use so-and-so's numbers. There's no true checking to see are the numbers actually actually realistic. But my favourite literally came out, we're, we're just, uh, it's two and a bit weeks away, weeks ago, a guy called Paul Romer. And he uh, hasn't got a Nobel Prize, he probably will at some stage, but he, wrote, he developed what's called endogenous growth theory, which is one of the major elements of mainstream economics. He's just become the World Bank's chief economist. And he published this paper, which is absolutely remarkable. So again, I do recommend clicking on that link and having a good read. He said, macro's gone backwards for three decades. And the, the, the models are there where they get fluctuations, they're fluctuations that aren't due to what anybody actually does. There are all these random shocks coming in. And he gets quite sarcastic here. This is the sort of stuff I write. It's amazing to see somebody like Paul Rohn, who's on the inside, writing him and said, he said they had all sorts of things, imaginary variables, to make change. Have you heard of what's, you know what phlogiston is? Okay, it doesn't exist. Okay, that's the first thing you need to know. But it, back before we discovered oxygen, and that fire it would mean that substances burnt, combusted with oxygen to produce you know, carbon dioxide. Before we knew that, to explain where flames came from, chemists seemed to have this thing called phlogiston, it was a subject, substance that came out of anything on fire. So it's an imaginary v variable to explain what chemists couldn't understand 300 years ago. And he's saying that's now built, something like that's built into our economic models. So we have a phlogiston that changes the amount of output, a troll making random changes to wages, a gremlin making random changes to the price of output, an ether. You know what ether is supposed to be? Ether was the substance that physicists used to use to explain why light would pass through a vacuum in outer space because they thought you had to have a substance which waves pass, like waves in the ocean only occur because there's physical material that gets compressed through which the uh, shock gets transmitted. So he's saying they've all got these imaginary substances inside here. And he said, looking back when these models were developed, they began by crit criticising the previous what are called Keynesian models, which were more empirically based models. Uh, and he said, what we have now is worse than what they criticised. We make models that are, have opaque assumptions that are no more, they're totally incredible. And the prediction that Keynesian models were wrong, they didn't predict an increase in inflation uh, occurring with a, a fall in the unemployment rate. He said, we've seen a much more false assumption made by these modelists. So writing back in 2003, Lucas said that macroeconomics has succeeded the central problem of depressions, of avoiding depressions, has been solved for many decades. So he predicted in 2003 there'd never be another event like the Great Depression. And four years later, he was wrong. So he said, Lucas's prediction is a far worse failure than anything the Keynesians ever got wrong. So what we're seeing, from my point of view, and again, I'm, I'm not holding my biases here, I do see them being like uh, astronomers like Ptolemy who had a model that accurately predicted where the planets were going to be, and that, by the way, is better than the neoclassicals have done, because the Ptolemaic model did work to say where Mars would be in 300 years. But when they saw craters on the moon, and particularly when they saw moons orbiting Jupiter, that was such a huge shock to the paradigm. What did they do? Well, the first reaction was to refuse to believe they were there. When they looked through Galileo's telescopes, those astronomers said, oh, no, there must, be, there must be something on the glass. We must be faking it somehow. Even when they made their own telescopes, because so they didn't trust Galileo, they'd see it in their own telescopes and think, oh, it must be something. God is testing my faith, would be an often answer that, you know, to this sort of stuff. So they can see a problem, but they think, well, how else do we model it? And this is Blanchard again. He's saying, all these objections are serious, but do they mean we should throw away this modelling approach? And he said, I don't think so. I think they still make the right sort of choice. And he comes down to saying that 
what they were trying to do in building macro models from micro is work out some fundamental basis on which you built models, some starting point everybody had to agree to. And he said that objective is a pipe dream, but it's a dream worth pursuing. And he then said, if that's the case, therefore, the choices they made seem like the right ones because he said you have to start from micro foundations. Where else can you start from? Okay. Not because he's proven that you must start from micro, but because he can't think of any other way to start than from micro. And I'll be showing you another way next week. Um, but no, actually not next week. Next week I'm going to talk about a bunch called the Austrians, Austrian economy. Have you heard of them? Some of you? Okay. You tend to find a lot more Austrian economists turn up working in uh, they work in firms that are trading on the stock market and financial markets. A lot of commentators will be Austrian economists. So their paradigm differs from the mainstream, but not by a huge amount. Their attitude to modelling is very different. They're actually anti-modelling in many ways. And some of them did predict the crisis without using a mathematical model, but looking at what they saw as being forces that cause a crisis. Some of them did say there's going to be a crisis. A guy called Peter Schiff. You heard that name at all? Okay, he's a market commentator and he was saying there's going to be a crisis. Mind you, he also expected massive inflation after the crisis, so he got some of his predictions wrong. But I'll talk about those guys next week. And uh, in the meantime, I'll try to add more background to the, to the uh, study space. Do click on, download the lecture and click on the links. That'll take you to many of the papers I'm talking about here.